Hello everyone, Marianne Hines here from Quantum Link Global. Um, I would like to welcome to our panel today, Michael DeHaan, who is Financial Wellness Leader at Quantum Link Global, but also David Harvey, who is the National Financial Wellbeing Manager for IOOF. We're here today to talk about a really important topic um, and one that I think every employer will be wanting to tune into and listen, and that is about financial wellness, um, particularly when we're looking at programs that support our employees and I think particularly in a COVID impacted world we've seen a lot of mental health challenges increase we only have to look at psychological injuries statistics for even New South Wales um, and the significant impact that we've seen that and rise that we've seen that over the last five years so I would first like to start off with what is actual financial wellness or well-being Michael, did you want to kick off? Yeah, I'd love to kick off. Thank you. And thanks, David, for being a part of this as well. Um, I suppose just a quick brief around my background. So I've been in the financial planning industry for over 25 years. I'm showing my age a bit there. But it was, also, it was all around my intellect around investing. There's nothing around the sort of emotional side of um, financial well-being and what does that mean? How does that affect your health in regard to your relationship with money? How it affects relationships? So... I went down that path so I could help more people. And again, some of the things that we'll go through in, in this particular meeting, and I, I know David will support that in regard to how can we better serve employers and employees in regard to that sort of financial stress and creating a financial wellbeing space. So just wanted to give that little bit of a brief. Great, thank you. And I wanted to share that it's, so financial wellbeing, I'm gonna flip it. So it's very much around that financial stress, yeah. And financial stress is around your relationship with money. So 90% of the clients, I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching, and 90% of my clients that first come to me, they've got anxiety around money. And the research that I've done around the behavioural side around money, the psychological side around money, is very much around that. It creates that sort of flight or fight, that anxiety, that can lead to depression and also have sort of relationship breakdowns. So... That's really what got me into this space. Um, I went down that pathway myself, so I know it well. And it was around taking my experience, taking my background and helping other people around their behavioural side. So, so when I say that, it's, it's really around everyone's got a story. Everyone's got a money story. And it was really how they were brought up around money. Yeah. And a lot of that's subconscious. So a lot of that just forms part of their program. And it really reflects on their sort of beliefs and their behaviours and on how they show up. So... When we talk about financial well-being and the work that um, David and I are sort of putting together, my sort of on the behavioural side, it's very much around understanding that story, learning those sort of habits and beliefs that are potentially holding people back and creating that stress in their body, working through that and then actually coming up with a plan on how to build that financial well-being, how do you build that financial freedom moving forward. So that's... That, that's my brief on it. Yeah. And we're all humans, right? So if we're employees, I know there's a lot of great employees out there that are talking about bringing your whole selves to work. But if you bring your whole self includes the financial stress and other stress. So um, I think that was a fantastic description. David, did you want to add to that and a little bit about yourself as well? Yeah, uh, look, thank you. Um, similar to Michael, I've been around in the industry for a couple of decades and change. Obviously, Michael and I started as very, very, very young men when we <laughs> when we commenced. Um, and I, I look, I probably break my career into two. The first year was product, you know, and, and equities and structured products and all that sort of schmancy stuff. But but what I noticed is I was further and further and further away from the client. <clears throat> you know, sort of the higher I worked up those those product lists. So I moved into the second part, which is where I am now, is, which is advice. But again, I found a paradox. And the paradox was that oftentimes the larger the account balances or the investable funds or the super balance or the larger um, the pay packet or the white of the collar, the more stress was involved, which is strange. And the other strange part is for the employers listening to this, you know, we're in a really fortunate country here. We're in a developed country, very rich country, country that's come through COVID actually extraordinarily well, yet the prevalence of stress has never been higher. Yeah. 
So for me, you know, financial well-being is about a state of mind. You know, I go to what Michael said earlier around those beliefs. The bad news is beliefs drive our behavior. The good news is beliefs drive our behavior. So if we can just shine a light on what those beliefs are, I think that's a tremendous first step. Tremendous first step. Where did they come from? They probably came from a well-meaning mass teacher or a grandma or something like that. But do they serve us? Maybe, maybe not. So just questioning that. The other thing that I think is interesting is that concept, you know, the Kahneman, Daniel Kahneman concept of thinking slow and considered versus thinking fast. When we're under stress, we're reacting. It's, as Michael was saying, fight or flight. We don't want to get eaten by that saber-toothed tiger or the credit card or whatever that may be. Whereas if we can step back, be considered, we can then be financially well and make really well-considered decisions. That, that's my definition. There's, there's some quant around that about being able to access emergency funds and other sort of quantitative bits, which I think we might get to later. But it's really about that state of mind and bringing your best self to work and, and your relationships and with the kids and whatever you're doing. Fantastic. And then if we look at this from a corporate employee, um, employer pers perspective, like what are some of the things that employers could be doing from, um, you know, we know that there's employee assistant programs out there, some corporates do do, add the financial wellness components, um, mm -hmm. a lot don't, I suspect. Um, so what yep. are some of the things that they can be doing? But also, probably even before that, what are you seeing, um, mm -hmm. given your vast experience in this Field. David, I might yeah. start with you on that one. Sure. Okay. Um, yeah, look, I've looked at this for, gosh, 15 years now and read the research. And um, again, I mentioned before, I think Australia is very well advanced in, in a number of different areas. I think we're a little behind in, in a couple. Um, and when I look to North America, uh, when I look to Europe, the UK in particular, th there's some standards there that organisations have. You know, you get your medical your dental, um, you know, the whole box and dice. And, and when you talk to, when I talk to sort of colleagues who work for those companies, that's just de rigueur, that's, that's just, you know, the norm. Yeah. Whereas here in Australia, we, we tend to focus on, okay, what am I getting paid? What's my bonus? I might look at if there's a group life or group sh uh, super insurance plan, maybe I'll value that, you know, a little gym car that I get, but, but that's kind of where it ends. Um, I think pleasingly, though, in Australia, we are seeing things like, you know, mental health initiatives and it's okay to not be okay. But I think where we're very much behind is in this financial wellness. And I think as an, well, I don't think, I, I know the research shows us that organisations are trying to solve for this. They are trying to solve. But unfortunately, Marianne, they're solving with very big, blunt taxes. And some of those big blunt axes are things like EAP programs. And I'm not deriding them. I've used them. Yeah. I've used them myself. Myself too. Bloody awesome. It, it really, one of the best things I could have done going through a tough period personally. Uh, this time last year, really struggled during lockdown. Reached out. Brilliant. Kylie, I'll, Kylie and I'll be mates for life. You know, the counsel I found there, she's bloody awesome. Good way, Kylie. Um, good on you, Kylie. Um, but, you know, I had to get to a particular point of repair before I reached out there, whereas I think there's a wonderful opportunity now and probably the best opportunity organisations have ever had, by the way, have ever had to actually get here, which is prepare their people um, from a resilience standpoint, from a financial wellness standpoint, from a mindfulness standpoint at the organisational levels. And, you know, rather than waiting to get here. And I think the other thing too, um, you know, oftentimes when we talk to people that is, they say, oh, we've got that sorted. You know, we've got a big super plan. Well, yeah. superannuation doesn't cut it. Superannuation is about a product. It's, a, it's about a retirement and it's valid for that but it does not solve for what Michael and I are talking about, just it's a fundamentally a state of mind. A state and of is mind. it more preventative that we're referring to here? Yeah, I think it's preventative, but I think it's also empowering. Yeah. I think the other thing too, Marianne, is I would challenge, challenge the term financial education and channel, challenge the term 
financial literacy. Again, Which we hear a lot of. We, we, we hear, hear a lot of, and I, I think they can be elements of a program, but again, you know, we're talking to very competent people in organisations. They're employed. They're bloody good at what they do, whether they be the director of first impressions or whether they be an HR manager or whether they be an engineer. Or you know, a CEO. Or yeah. a CEO. You know, they're very well credentialed and, and they must be because Australian employers in general, you know, are, are, are top class, right? So for you to be employed, you are credentialed. You know, you're good at yeah. what you do. But does that translate to you being manage, able to manage your own profit and loss statement at home and your own balance sheet at home? And, and look, there's the other old adage of the plumber's taps always leaking. So you're... you're the David Harvey file, unfortunately. I have not heard that one before, but <laughs> <laughs> you have now. I have that, now. That's an old. That's an old. Oh, I'm a boy from a bush. So that's <laughs> my best mate, um, David, through school. His dad was the local builder, and for 14 years of knowing David, there was always a tarp over the back of his his house because <laughs> because his dad was always preparing everybody else's houses. <laughs> not his own. Not his own. You know, so. You know, I think organisationally, it's okay to not be okay in this department. It doesn't mean that you're uneducated. It doesn't mean that you're illiterate. It just means that you've not shone the light here. And maybe some actionable tools, concepts, things that, I mean, the other little thing, and I will stop, but the other little thing is a lot of this is proprietary. And what I mean by that is traditionally financial services organisations have held it here and you have to come to us and you have to buy something for us or invest in us or whatever, and then we'll give you a snippet of it. Well, let's flip that. Let's give the best of what we can to the individual such that they're empowered to have real conversations around the kitchen table. The kids get on board, the partner gets on board, everybody gets on board, and then the family's financially well. And so is their community and then the organisation in and of itself. Yeah, and I think also um, a couple of thoughts as you were talking is that, you know, it's not like this is going to be an additional cost for employers because this is something that is already being spent but in another way, so more of a reactive support way, whereas I think what you're proposing here is that we get more um, proactive <laughs> with our approach and um, and it's not just around the tools and um you know, the superannuations and investments, it's about addressing those behavioural things that no matter what um, you put on, build what, you know, walls and that you put up, if the foundation oh. isn't right, it's going to keep, you know, sabotaging it. So I think that you've raised some really good points there. Australian companies last year spent $9 billion on wellbeing. Wow. 9,000 million bucks. Okay. Now, <clears throat> there's a really interesting MetLife study. So, so MetLife, we've worked with those guys for a number of years ago, and it's mainly um, North America, but the last half a dozen years it's been here in Australia, and there's some really interesting stats in which they do, surprise, surprise, actually ask employees what they want. What a revelation. Okay, so here we have employers building ivory towers and breakout rooms and cones of silence and fruit none baskets. of which we can use in sydney at the moment <laughs> no newspapers and, and and fruit bar and i'm not deriding all that you know and, and obviously eap programs and mental health clearly there's an ecosystem of well-being there that's been built but this this research actually you know surprise surprise asked employees what they want and the number one thing they value are financial tools that they can implement for them themselves and their family it's the number one thing that they value. So that's not being sold for and addressed. Yeah, I think that's um, that's a pretty important highlight. Michael, I'd be interested in your insights and what you've seen um, working with your clients, both individually and from a business corporate perspective. Yeah, no, thanks. And that was a really good um, summary, David. I, I quite enjoyed listening to that. And I just want to add to the work that um, David and I are doing. It's very much around transparency. I want to put out there and... Um, been a part of this industry for so many years there is a lot of that sort of negative press around product around commissions and that that can actually as in the corporate's eyes go you're going to come in here and you're just going to flog a product 
So they've got a responsibility as, as, a, as a business as well to look after their employees. So the work that we're doing around it, it's purely service focused. So it's purely empowering the employees to look at their situation and give them tips and guidance on how to move forward. And it's not product driven. And the transparency I'm, I'm proud of, and I know we've done some work around it, David, where corporates can have, have a look at it and look right through it and really mm. get a good understanding of what the program is how will it add value to our employees and change their lives? So mm. just wanted to share that. Um, and I do think, um, Michael, that's a, actually a really important point because I know, even though in my experience and throughout my career is like that concern around um, having someone come in around financial wellness and then selling yes. the products is, has, yeah. been, has been raised several times. Yeah. I wanted to, because uh, the employee assistance programs, and I know you touched on that, David, and I, I looked up the... And the term, what it actually means, and I, I'll read it out because I, I had to sort of reflect on that and look at how do we add value to that. Um, so it's a work-based intervention program designed to enhance the emotional, mental, and general psychological well-being of all employees. So that that's what corporates are looking at, and that that sounds great. Imagine if you could deliver all that. Yeah. But then I look on the flip side in regard to some of the recent studies um, from SafeWorks New South Wales, which Marianne would be aware of, but in regard to psychological claims over the last five years, it's increased by 53%. Hmm. Being pre-COVID. Pre-COVID, well. yeah. yeah. And then you're looking at the average cost per claim of $85,000 and the time off work for each claim is 175 days. So I acknowledge what you said before, David, about you know, corporates and, and these employee assistance programs working together, but I just see a gap. I see the gap. Financial stress. Thanks, Michael. Financial stress is the number one, the number one contributor to personal stress. It's the number one. Yeah. Now, and that again, pre-COVID, that that's been the case, and unfortunately, it's rising. Again, that's the paradox. And I know we're constricted on time. My belief on that is, is expectations. I look at when my mum and dad got married, they were up the road, not too far from where I am now in a little fibro. They were the first street on the house to have a black and white telly. They were the only street on the, at the house at that point to have a car and it was a little Hillman. Whereas now, well, you're in a two story McMansion with six screens and three cars and the list goes on and on. So, you know, that's the world we live in and that's not yeah. good nor bad, it just is. But with that level of expectation comes all of the other stuff that comes with it. So um, yes, I'm not, again, psychological safety is absolutely utterly paramount. But if we think of the Maslow hierarchy of needs and we're down here and we're worried about whether we can actually pay bills. Yeah, or eat. Or eat. You yeah, know, or, or the car is going to get repossessed. We cannot be up here in innovation. Absolutely. Employers now, you know, Michael's nailed it. People will take time off work. If they're at work, they'll either be actually looking at a spreadsheet or dealing with a credit card company or a partner who's yelling at them because they've spent too much money on something. But even if they're not, and that's all um, tangible costs that we can measure. There's the intangible cost. They're not innovating. They're not inventing, they're not their best selves. It's head down, you know, proverbial up, not getting fired and yeah. not sticking their head up above the parapet to actually yeah. expand themselves. So they're surviving, not thriving. Exactly right. Yeah. 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 And that's where we talk about, and Marianne, we, one of our ethos is bringing your whole self to work. And it's, it's an easy thing to say, but it's not as easy to do so. A part of what we're doing is really understanding with the corporates what their existing program is and how we can actually collaborate in regard to adding that value. So we're not saying to a corporate, drop what you're doing, it's not working. We're saying, how do we actually add value and have a really holistic approach to employee wellness? Almost like so, that up level, that little tweak to up level it. Yeah. And then you're looking at wellness, you're looking at safety, you're looking at Employees, yeah. you said it, you know it before, David. So they can be creative so and innovative. So they can be, yeah, innovation, creativity, and and be their best, which is what you know 
Well, then what guidance would you go? So any employer, um, leader, business owner that's listening today, um, what's the one step that they could take to, um, you know, address the challenges that we are, that we've just talked about today? Uh, David, I'll start with you. Well, I'd, I'd be happy to take a phone call. <laughs> Uh, and I sort of say that glibly, but I really mean it, you know, and this is why, and again, I'm not sort of saying it for the benefit of, of sort of Michael or Marianne, but I mean, the really cool thing is we're having this conversation. We are normalising the, up until this point in time, the, the, the not spoken. So again, when I grew up, um, you never asked who you voted for or what you might have asked about your denomination or your beliefs, you could certainly ask about the footy team. That's now changed. You know, you can socially talk about those sort of things. You can socially talk about sexuality. In fact, you can even in a professional environment acknowledge that. Can't necessarily ask about it, but you can acknowledge it and be okay with that. Mm -hmm. And you can actually now be at the point where you're okay to not be okay. I think there's still work to do there. But, but that stigma is slowly, slowly being um, produced. But it is verboten. It is forbidden to not be okay in relation to your finances. That, that's the last taboo. It's the last bastion. So I think... The, Yet it's the, the one with the, um, such a significant impact on well-being. It's, it's the biggest and productivity and correct. presenteeism. Correct. That's, so, that's why it's last. Yeah, it's, it's why it's yeah, exactly. Because it's the biggest. Yeah, thank you, Michael. It's and, and for individuals too. you know, just talking to individuals listening to this. Again, it's it's the, it's the big bleeding rhino sitting in right in the middle of the boardroom table. OK. And so I think maybe I, I was going to answer that question by saying, ask your people. But maybe, you know, maybe a first step is, is to ask yourself as a people. That, I was going to say, ask yourself. But maybe that's, maybe it's that. Where do you as a people leader sit in relation to this? What are your, um, what's your framework or paradigm around this space of financial fullness? I was, I was reading the, um, the Edelman Trust Barometer. I've looked at that for a number of years now. And again, I think we're in a, in fact, research shows we're in an inflection point. So a lot of trust um, in institutions such as banks, which Michael referred to, financial services companies, governments, um, the local police sergeant, all that is going that direction at a rate of knots. But the one bastion that still remains is our employer. Trust there is still high. And, and I think there's a real fantastic, perhaps once in a generation opportunity to leverage from that. So as a people leader, perhaps start there realize that your employees are looking to you for guidance, looking for you, to you for vulnerability, authenticity. So where do you sit in relation to this topic and how are you demonstrating that you're willing to tackle this um, absolutely transparently? Absolutely yeah. transparently. Maybe that's a great place to start. Yeah, and I think to add to that, um, before I flip to you, Michael, is the time is now. Like um, COVID, whether we like it or not, has disrupted our norms and our, our normal ways of operating. So it does actually present a very um, profound opportunity mm. to reestablish what um, the new norms will be going forward. Michael, I'd really love to hear your perspective as well. I think you really nailed it, David. So, but. I'd also just like to share that really high quality employees, this is what they're looking for. They're looking for that environment of belonging. They're looking for that environment that their, their business owner, their corporate um, trusts them and believes in them. So it really is a, a time of change. I'm excited about it because you can either go on that journey or start losing potential really good employees and, and that's going to affect the business dramatically. So it's a, it's a great time for adaptive leaders, for, for businesses of the future to shine now. And again, I'm, I'm so excited about it because being able to bring this into an existing program and just see the value, see how it grows, not only leaders, but it grows employees from the bottom up. It's, um, it's, it's a pretty exciting space. So. Yeah, it offers great. the opportunity for them to be an employer of choice. Exactly right. Yeah. Oh, can I share a quick story? 
Please do. You can, we can end on a quick story. <laughs> cool. Um, just one little thing I would say too, just, just before I get to that, when we think about, you know, for any board members or, or C-suite listening to this, when we think about ESG, I think from a, from a G, the governance component, Australia does that pretty bloody well in particular in our industry, you know, the financial services, but again, across other professions. So I think that governance compliance tech, because you got to, right? <clears throat> Environmental, thankfully, I think that's now nascent, but still starting to be addressed. And, and, and you can measure both of those things. They're measurable. The S is more challenging. How is it that you can measure as an organization your social impact? What are the data points that you can point to? A really successful financial wellbeing program, I think, is, a, is an element of that. You can demonstrate that you've moved the dial in relation to financial wellbeing for your people. You can demonstrate that they've embarked on some sort of advice journey of their own, whether it be you know, logging into the app or having a one-to-one -one conversation or met Michael or whatever. So I think it's a really interesting opportunity to actually demonstrate that S component. And employees, thankfully, are asking about this now. They're asking, where do you stand in relation to these three things? G is probably hygiene. E and S, I think, are the, are the, the ways forward. I'll tell you a very quick story. So, so we, we worked on this program really hard. I've got a, a, I'm really lucky where I work. We've got a, people that sort of gather around the campfire and that, you know, campfires grow and grow and grow. A really smart, dedicated people who want to really lift the financial well-being of all Australians, all Australians. So with that ethos, we first went to some existing corporates. They loved it. They're oh, fantastic. You, you're adding all this value now. But I'll never forget our first new co. So this is a, a financial services group, ironically, that we went to. Really smart, tech-heavy group. And their very, very first, back when you could get on site, uh, seminar, we had about 25 people in the room. And we had some of the people leaders, and then we had some of the senior people. And then, but interestingly, the director of first impressions took her headphones off, stopped answering calls, and came into the seminar. So we ran our seminar, and off we went, and we did a few other things. About four months later, we got a note from her, and it was copied into the CEO. David, it's the best thing I've ever done. We cut up the credit cards. I went home that night, had a chat to my partner. We absolutely saved, 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 saved. He's put in some stuff, money. I put in some money, got a little bit more from elsewhere, and we're buying our first apartment. It's the best thing. Thank you so much. It's the best thing we ever could have done. And I get a little bit of a tear in my eye everything I think about that because traditional programs never would have interacted with the director of first impressions. And yet now, and look, she's there today. It was four years later and I still am in touch with her. She won't will probably leave that organization because it was part of the conduit for her to buy her first apartment. Yep. And I think that's important that this is about for all people, like all people, um, you know, from my perspective, have the right to feel safe, whether that be psychological or psychologically or physically, um, but all people have the right to um, to build wealth, whatever Absolutely. that may look. Yeah, it's a, merit way. it's a meritocracy. Yeah. You know, everybody, again, I go back to what I said earlier, from a practical standpoint, I've been in an industry which has held all the cards close to our chest and, and you've got to pay to play. Yeah. And let's flip that and give everyone in the organisation who wants to, you know, from a yeah. meritocracy standpoint, if they don't want to, that's cool. It's not. That's their choice. Yeah. It's their choice. They get to opt into this, um, but they do so in a really powerful fashion. Well said. And anything you want to add finally, Michael, any short stories? <laughs> <laughs> now, I think, Dave, that, that summary and that, that emotional story, um, I, th I think I will add one thing that I think the stats show is that if you've got that financial wellness program that um, it's, and it's more of an overseas stat, to be honest, but employees are staying in the business for about eight years, which is um, when you look at the churn of what employees are after, what makes them feel safe or, or belong, I think that's just a fairly compelling stat. And you sharing that stat around that um, young lady just sort of brought that up again. So thank you.
Well, I love the work that you're doing, um, David and Michael, and I wanted to say a big thank you for um, taking the time to share your insights and your perspectives and your learnings. Um, I think there's a lot of value here for um, employers and employees alike. So there will be contact details um, in this post as well. Thank you again. Thank you all. Thanks, Gloria. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, David.